Well, hello, my name's Evie Sobchak. I'm a 17-year-old senior from Shorecrest Prep, and for the past five years, I've been researching algae in order to produce an economically and environmentally friendly biodiesel to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. So let me tell you a little bit about the algae to oil process. First, you start with cultivating the algae, growing it to large quantities. Then you go into harvesting the algae, taking the biomass out of solution. Then in the extracting phase, you extract the fatty acids, the lipids, from the biomass. And lastly, in the transestifying phase, you turn these fatty acids into a biodiesel we can use. All right, well, let me tell you a little bit about my research. So first, I start off with the planning. I draw all of my designs on AutoCAD. So first, I do that before I go to the machine shop and actually build. Okay, and when I do that, I build my, all my machines that I use. So why do people, like why use algae? because it's a great resource. Not only does it absorb CO2 out of our environment, but it doesn't take a lot of land for it to grow. About half the size of Maine it would take to grow enough algae to power our whole US. And it's carbon neutral. So when you burn, out, when you burn the fuel, the algae absorbs the CO2 out of the environment, making it carbon neutral. So into the planning, which I was talking about. When I plan it, I do all my drawings on AutoCAD and then build my machines. As you can see down there, I have a CV chamber, a control variable chamber. This creates the environment for my algae to grow in. This creates a closed loop system with my vessels, which I have a prototype right here. And what it does is it allows the CO2 to rotate throughout my vessels, giving it an environment to grow in and giving it food. So then I go on to building my machines. Here's my prototype. What I do is I use two forms of mechanical, ag two forms of agitation, mechanical agitation and air agitation. My mechanical agitation is produced by my rotary unions and gear motors. It allows the vessels to rotate, creating turbidity, allowing the algae to get to the optimal amount of photons, moving it from the inside of the vessel to the outside. Then I also have air agitation, which is produced by my air stone. What happens is as it rotates, half the time it's producing aqueous and half the time airborne CO2, allowing my algae to absorb both types. So as it's cultivating, as it's growing inside, I have double walled vessels. It, because in between each wall, I had either neon, helium, or natural. That's because they each let through a different light spectrum. The neon, the red, orange, the helium, the blue, green, and the natural, the full light spectrum. Now, a common misconception is that algae grows the best under the blue light because it's of high energy. But actually, the blue light reflects off my algae cell wall, so none of it's absorbed, while the red light has better penetration through the algae cell, speeding up the cell cycle, producing more ATPs, allowing the algae to grow to larger quantities. So as my algae is growing in, as you can see by about the eighth week, CO2 consumption outpaced growth rate. So from my experimentation, the optimal growing time is about eight weeks. Also, as my algae was growing inside my vessels, it was becoming acidic because of all the CO2 I was adding in, forming carbonic acid. So I added in sodium carbonate, which rose the pH to a more basic neutral level, allowing more lipids to be produced and growing the algae to larger quantities. At about the 12th week, I shut off CO2 consumption to stress out my algae to produce more lipids and bring it to a basic neutral level. So next is the harvesting process, taking this biomass out of the solution. Currently, they use centrifuge, which uses a ton of energy, which just raises the price of the algae fuel. So I use the power of gravity. Thank you, Newton. So what I do is I add in iron powder. This Fe2 ionically bonds with oxygen in H2O forming Fe2O3, an iron oxide, which acts like a polymer sticking to the algae cell wall through columbic interactions, van der Waals IFAs. When it clings to the algae cell wall, it forms a matrix, making it dense and sinking to the bottom. I then simply dewater the remaining solution from my surface, and because I use no harmful chemicals, I take this water and recycle it and grow it into more algae. 
I then take my biomass and run over into Mindia magnet to release any excess iron powder and begin the next step of extracting. Now in the extracting process, this is where I have my baby. This is my cellulose blaster, which I invented, which combines osmotic shock, homogeneization, and sonication into one machine. What I do is I take my algae slurry and put it into this vessel and add in salt. Because I use freshwater algae, the salt creates osmotic shock. So all the water inside the algae cell wants to move its way out, removing the slimy pectin layer from my algae cell, making it vulnerable. Then I use an air compressor and pump up the pressure to about 10 atmospheres. Then I attach the apparatus. When I open up this valve, it comes shooting out at such a high velocity and it goes through this tiny orifice. The orifice is about 1 32nd of a diameter and the smallest drill bit I could find in Home Depot. As it goes through this tiny orifice, it's bombarded by ultrasonic waves. And I design ultrasonic horns that increase the frequency of my waves. So as it goes through this tiny orifice, it's bombarded by these waves, shearing the algae cell completely. And it's coming out at such a high velocity that I had to build a velocity decelerator to slow it down before entering in the beaker below. I then give it a couple distilled water baths, and at the end, I have a lipid layer on top. I take the lipid layer off and begin the next step of extracting. Currently in the extracting phase, they use all these dangerous chemicals like hexane and chloroform, which not only harms our environment, but raises the prices. And what's the point of creating a renewable biodiesel if you're harming our environment and it's so costly that no one wants to use it? So I use barium hydroxide and methanol. I use barium hydroxide because it's a large molecule and a strong base, making it a great catalyst. I take my barium hydroxide methanol in a three to one mole ratio to my algae triglycerides and put it in a shaker for three hours. This speeds up catalytic conversions. So it removes the glycerol from my fatty acids and replaces it with carbon, creating a large carbon chain. And that creates a large octane, which means it's better for our cars, better for our environment, better gas mileage. And at the end, after a couple more distilled water baths, I have my unfiltered oil G which is my biodiesel that we could run in our cars. So enough about my research. Let me talk about where Science Fair has taken me. First, I started off at the county level. And after winning county, I went on to the state level, where I talked to <coughs> Governor Rick Scott about my Science Fair. After winning states, I moved on to Intel ISEF, which is the biggest competition in the world for Science Fair. And it was all the way out in Phoenix, Arizona this year. So on the drive over there, I stopped by iSweep, an international science world engineering energy and environment fair. And after iSweep, I moved on to Intel iSTEF. And it was a blast this year. Not only did I win first in my category and best and fair in my category, but I won the Innovative Exploration Award, which gave me the opportunity to visit Caltech and the JPL in Pasadena, California over the summer. So first at Caltech, I met the amazing Dr. David Baltimore, who's a Nobel laureate for discovering the retrovirus. And what was so cool about him was not only did he tell me about all his scientific adventures, but he was interested in my research, even though it has nothing to do with what he's studied. So then I moved on to the JPL, where I met the director of the JPL and also saw the Mars rover. And the Mars rover they have here is the exact replica of the one they have on Mars. And before they do anything way up there, they first do it in the Mars yard. And I actually sat in on a Mars rover meeting, but I can't tell you anything about it because I was sworn to secrecy. So what's great about science fair is all the people you meet. It's truly a human geography class in real life. We might not have the same culture, speak the same language, but the one thing we have in common is our passion for science. And we could talk for hours about it. Here are just some of the friends I've met on my years. So the girls on top are from Malaysia. These girls are from Kazakhstan. The people on the bottom are from South Korea. My favorite guys from Saudi Arabia. And these girls are from Egypt. And I actually stay in contact with them and instant message them regularly. So how I all began. Many people look at my science fair now and think, how did you ever get there? And I always tell them it started way back in fifth grade, where my science teacher told me we'd be studying the scientific method. I had absolutely no idea what it was about. And that year, I powered clocks running off fruits. 
I thought it was the coolest thing ever that I could power a clock off an orange. And from there, I began my science journey. In, seven, in sixth grade, I actually became involved in helping the environment and producing renewable energy. And that's when I did solar panels, then followed by wind, and in eighth grade, I began my algae journey. But it actually started in seventh grade in Currents Events class, where I read an article about how algae will power our future. And I thought, how can pond scum run a car? But now I truly believe it's the next step and I wanna see my algae fuel on the gas station so it could be an opportunity. So who's helped me along the way? I actually don't have a direct mentor. I do all my experimentation around my house, in my garage, on the dining room table, I have my algae samples in the fridge, but the community has helped me a lot throughout the years. First, I have to thank all my amazing teachers at Shorecrest for helping me, getting me allowing me to use the microscope and for the director of Pinellas County Science Fair, Mr. Dickman, and also for the Pinellas Living Green Expo with Steve Pleiss, and the mayor, Bill Foster, for helping me, and also all the amazing guys at Home Depot who helped me pick out all the tools I need. So why get kids involved in science fair? One, it's given me a focus for my education. I've picked this and I'm going to take it with me and create a business out of it. Second, it helps with public speaking. I was always that shy kid that never wanted to speak in front of people. But now I've spoken in front of professors at Caltech, to Nobel laureates at the JPL, to entrepreneurs at the Collective Biodiesel Conference, to community leaders at the Rotary Club. And lastly, it's given me confidence. So how to get kids involved in science fair? First, tell them to pick a passion. Find something you're interested in and stick to it. Second, read everything you can about it. Doesn't matter if it's blogs, journal articles, newspapers, books, anything you could get your hands on, read about it. And lastly, have grit. You don't need a mentor or a lab to have a passion and stick through it. Take it from start to finish and stay with it. So what am I doing this year? Currently, I'm working on genetically engineering my own algae cell on my dining room table. First, this is my natural algae cell, and that's my genetically engineered algae cell. I'll tell you more about it once it's complete. And if you want to keep up to date on my research, follow me on Twitter, where you can tweet at me, message me, anything. And remember, stress just means you're working hard.